Okay, I'll call the is that good down there, Jake. We need to be closer. Yeah. Oh, you're good. Okay. Uh, call the January 10th, 2024 meeting of the Monona Park and Rec Board to order. Uh, noted who's here and who's not. We're missing two people. Right. Okay. Uh, is there a motion to approve the minutes of the December 13th meeting? Yes. Move to approve. Okay, sorry, second. Yeah, I'll second. Uh, uh, any changes? None. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The minutes are approved. Under appearances, we have one. One in person, anyway. So, mm -hmm. Kathy Carew, if you want to take a seat up here if you want. Oh, that'd be great. I'm in here or here. Yeah. Like this. <laughs> you might. Oh, yeah. There you go. Thanks, Jeff. My name is Kathy Kuru. I live at 4905 Rothman Place. I know everybody on this side of the table. I'm <laughs> not here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my uh, husband and I have been pretty active throughout the years in Monona. So, um, even though um, this might take five minutes, there's six other people at least that aren't here because I've talked to a lot of people and I'm basically representing them. So if you wouldn't mind being patient with my okay. my talk here, and I've written it so I can stay on track. <clears throat> I live at 4905 Rothman Place. Our home is right on the park in the northeast corner. My family has owned this house since 1954. That's 70 years. We've seen the park go through many changes. I understand that you are working on some plans for the north end of the park, and that is why I am here. I can speak for us and other neighbors that we love having activity in the park. It means we belong to a vibrant community. Whatever I'm going to say has nothing to do with not wanting park users or noise that comes with it. We love seeing the park in use. My focus, my first focus is the proposed design plan for the path from Green, Greenway to the shelter house. I understand the plan is not finalized yet, so I hope you can take into account what I have to say. If you were to ask any of the homeowners around Fireman's Park what green space grassy area is used most, they would agree that it is the area just outside the east side of the shelter. It is used every day for summer camp when that is going on. This area is where the camp sets up games, plays team sports, and a meeting area for participants and camp counselors. On any weekend, you will have groups, clubs, families that have rented the shelter uh, and use this space. They set up bouncy houses, sometimes more than one, and very big ones. Our own family has rented the shelter at least one dozen times over the years. We've used this grassy area for people who set up folding chairs to just visit, sit in the sun, or be a spectator for sports or games that we've set up and for laying out blankets for little ones or picnic lunch. As you can see, widely used for many purposes. As I read your plan, the path comes up straight through the park to the shelter, to the center of the shelter house, right through the middle of this area. It would interrupt all that is going on there. Also, if you're thinking about bikers using this path, the plan creates a 90 degree turn right when it hits the shelter. It's not easy to navigate. And now think about it being a walker on the path. You enter the path from the greenway end, you round the curve, head towards the shelter where it's taking you, and you realize that if you continue, you will be heading right into the middle of a private party or summer camp. At some point, you will step off the path onto the grass and reroute yourself to wherever you want to go. I heard something about wanting to make this path ADA compliant. Maybe even set up some spectator bleachers now that the big baseball field on the north end is gone, you can make me make that a soccer field closer to the parking lot and have a path and bleachers right there where we used to actually have some. The areas that have been playing football will be accessible by the path that connects the skate park and the shelter. This path is very desirable and makes sense. It is interesting along the lagoon and lovely near the trees and purposeful in connecting the park areas. 
I believe it looks like the small baseball field at the end of the greenway will be taken out. You could make a soccer field right there. Easy access and there's already a pad and bleachers there for spectators. Just a couple of options. We can see walkers through the park every day. The natural path most people take is actually on the diagonal. From one, the end of Greenway diagonally to the exit out of the park onto Progressive. So one might wonder how much this design would be used if it is not the natural course people take. When talking about the proposal to a number of others, they all said a path anywhere in this big green space is aesthetically not appealing. With the popularity of different sports going up and down, as we've seen over the years, do we really want to lock this space up for specific sport by putting a path in, but instead leave it open so it can be more fluid for the changes coming in the future? In 1961, the original plan had a path going straight across from Greenway. I know you're trying to accommodate for space needed for the baseball softball fields, but maybe those fields have to be rethought. The uses seem to change. We love having them there, but maybe you just have one field, not two. What does a huska give us that the need is less for Winnipeg Park? We love the summer night weekend tournaments, but that has some issues, and now what should we plan for? One more thought about the path this morning. During the pandemic, our daughter and her family lived with us. In the summer of 2020, we took our two-year-old grandsons to parks in Green County, Baraboo, and Milwaukee. We went to 38 different parks. We didn't explore every square inch of every park, but my husband and I agree that yes, many parks are lined on the edges with homes, but not a single park had a path so close to homes as you are proposing in this design. Not a single one. Maybe it is for respect for the homeowner's privacy. And again, we have plenty of activities right outside the boundaries of our backyard with no complaints from us or our neighbors, but nothing that would be an established, permanent, fixed, and in constant and consistently as this in use consistently as this path. Would it be it would be very different and imposing? Now I want to address the proposed sidewalk at the entrance of the park. There so in the north end, the original entrance was direct, straight, and even had some parking space because it was so wide. About 16 years ago, the engineers did a great job in redesigning the new entrance by creating it with a gentle but deliberate curves into the parking lot. Vehicles have to slow down. It's a natural speed control. I have never known there to be one single pedestrian accident here. Do we really need a sidewalk? The sidewalk design has a random point where pedestrians are directed to cut across the park to the park site. Is this safer? There is an issue with the landscaping that was just done. It is my understanding that if you put a sidewalk in that butts right up to the curb, the sidewalk has to be six feet or 72 inches wide. A small grouping of five evergreen trees were planted together about three quarters of the way into the park. The closest tree is only eight inches away from the road. That would leave only, sorry, 80 inches away from the road. That would leave only eight inches for this very young tree. In no time, it will be growing into the sidewalk space, which will need more maintenance. Right in that area where these trees are planted, the ground slopes down to the road, to where the trees are, maybe a foot or so for the first 80 inches. Not sure how that would be addressed to make it level for a sidewalk. We hate the thought of work just done that would have to be redone. The bottom line is sidewalks are nice. Engineers and designers could figure this out, but do we really need it? And is it something we should spend money on? In trying to get current to what is going on, I viewed the beautiful drone video of Century Park and Vernon Hills that you have on your website. Absolutely spectacular, but it is nothing similar to Winnicott Park. They have two sizable lakes and 114 acres with mature trees, very wooded areas, and apparently a lot more money. We have 40 acres with a lagoon. Century Park has some elements that we could incorporate. Love their sledding hill. A little history, we used to have what we call the mound in the park behind Winnipeg School where the baseball fields are now, and that was great to use all year round. Anyway, of the 38 parks that we visited, there are three that stand out to me that would be a much better comparison for Winnicott. 
You may know them. First is Lakeview Park in Middleton. Fishing pond, shelter house, great playground, splash pad, lots of green space and pads. Second is Gorez Park in Lodi. Smaller, but it has a brook, bridge, playground, swimming pool, green space, and a lovely path that connects all the features of the park. And the third is Wanakee Village Park, also smaller, but a great feel. Lovely shelter house, creek, bridge, playground, gazebo, paths. And all these parks have sports fields. Worth checking out for idea, very comparable to Winnequa. We are so proud to be residents, proud to be residents of Monona with all that it offers. When it comes to what feel is important, what is the maintenance of what we already have? What made the parks that we went to such a pleasure was that they were very clean and well-maintained. I think the city does a great job in keeping our parks and cities clean. However, I do have one example of an improvement. Many of the parks we visited did not have sandboxes. Not sure why. We, however, are very lucky because we do. We always have so much fun at Maywood Sandbox. In the shade, tons of sand toys, broken or not, lovely painted and rondack chairs. We have our own beach where the fun in the sand is endless. Byron's Park has a sandbox. Great way to mix up the playtime. But last year, so much sand got dumped that it was overflowing on the edges and not just by a little, it was not inviting. We have an old volleyball court by the Dream Park. I've seen many kids play there in the sand on my walks. It is not being maintained as a volleyball space. So let's make it into official sandbox. The size would be awesome. It would be a great addition to Dream Park and not very costly. There is more to discuss but I want to respect that you have a full meeting. We are so lucky to be living in a community that has such great parks. Thank you so much for your attention, time, and reconsideration. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Give me that. that makes it better. Okay. Um, you know how this works, though. When under your parent sections, we don't get into a back and forth. I understand. It. Yes. And the, at least the pathway design piece of that will be coming here. Hopefully next month. Hopefully next month. Mm -hmm. so, stay tuned. Yes. So I know two people couldn't make it, and I'm happy to send this out. I've got it yeah, kept out, so send it to the board. Please. Yeah. Right. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. Really Thank appreciate you. it. Thank you. For those who don't know, we wouldn't have a skate park for that. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> Only took five years. Right back. Right. All right. Um, oh, Josh wants to speak. Oh. Josh Deach or not? Josh Deach, did you want to speak? No, nope, I would just I just had the opportunity to listen in. Okay, thank you. Um, do we still need to go into closed session? Do we need to go into closed session? I mean, it's posted that way on the, the agenda. Yeah. I don't think if we actually need to at this point, but oh. Well, yeah, we don't have to just because it's supposed to. Okay. So, yeah. Um, I mean, because it's basically, this is the final negotiated agreement we have, right? Correct. So we're not going to give away any negotiated trade secrets no. to the school. So, no. Then let's not, I don't, there's no need to go into closed session. So we'll go to 5C recommendation. For the Maywood School Facility Use Agreement. So I just screwed up the order <laughs> next. Okay, so this is probably pretty similar to the one we had last month that Missy sent out after the redacted that just finalizes the terms. Um, with legal on both sides between the city and school district. Uh, we are looking at scheduling a first reading on the 16th at city council. School board has one meeting on Wednesday, January 24th. And then we would have second reading, um, the first meeting in February for final approval. And with this agreement, we'd be looking at starting on uh, June 1st of 2024 and moving our summer, summer camp program um, this summer. 
Uh, our registration starts February 15th. Um, and we have kind of a full court press then to see what the interest of the 4K group would be so we can be hiring those positions that would be taking care of that. Um, with the start date of the new staff, June 1, they would work our summer program, move into fall. May 1, mostly. Or May 1. Have time before Cam. Um, oh, let me just get it here. Oh. Yeah, I'll As stated before, um, we have exclusive use over a, a good portion of the building, uh, non exclusive use with the transitional ed and it's. I get some feedback sometimes, and it sounds like my voice is really slow. Of course, my patience level is. Uh, so the, the, the term is we have exclusive use over a good chunk of the room, which includes the map. Um, and that's been negotiated and discussed. So the transitional ed program from the school district as a special ed program for 19 to 21 year olds is there now and will be in the building as part of this um, use of Maywood School. And so that's in the map. Uh, the school district will basically take the janitorial and working on the inside part of the building. Uh, the city and park and rec department will uh, do maintenance on the ground. So snow plowing in the parking lot, um, the sidewalks, mowing uh, in the summer, you know, in, in the mowing season. We pay the school district a sum of $5,000 per month. And it's a five-year term, a five-year lease agreement. Um, we toured the building with all of our staff last week. And I think, of course, it's a great, it's a, it's a old school and it's perfect for what we do um, for out of school time activities. It also gives us the opportunity to take some of our other enrichment classes that are currently at the community center and move them to Maywood. And that would be for uh, both youth programming and adult programming on the nights and weekends. Um, and open our community center back up for um, more senior program opportunities uh, and city events. So volunteer appreciation, more senior, larger scale programs that can be used in the main hall. Anything to add on that missing? Um, we, cut, we talked about it a little bit quite a bit last time, so not, none of this should be all that new. Um, and I think it would just be good to have a recommendation from this committee to council in support of the agreement uh, as we move forward. Here you go. Jake, at the uh, last meeting, which we had talked about is that with the program, the fees that people pay for the program would cover the cost. Does that cover the 5,000 a month? Yes. Yes. No? Yeah. So the, the rec budget that was approved for the 2024 20, included the rental fees uh, for this program. And so um, it was pretty budget neutral overall in what we proposed. Um, so yeah, it's a it's a market rate program um, to be able to pay for 100% of the staff, uh, including full time staff and benefits, and any cost of the program, including rent. That is split with summer camp as well. So those right. full time positions, summer camp and after school. Okay. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Would it make sense to make a motion and then have a discussion yeah, if there are any additional yeah. questions? So I would move we accept the lease as is. Okay, is there a second? Sorry. I was just suggesting, Jake, that we um, uh, make a motion to accept it. And then that would also allow for additional time for any questions or discussion. Okay. So I would, I would so move that we accept the lease as is. All right, is there a second? Second. Patrick. <laughs> Any further discussion? We've talked about it 
before, and I know one of Bill's big points was to make it a five year lease instead of three that they had asked for. So, looks, looks good to me, I think. So, on record, Jeff, two pickleball courts that's inside the multi purpose room. <laughs> <laughs> a bonus. <laughs> so, yeah, I have just a, a, a question for clarification. In the, in the lease agreement, there are several things regarding taxes. What are the taxes and how does that work over there? It's not just a boilerplate part of the lease. There is no taxes. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay. And I. Uh, I actually had a different question. Um, yeah, I think both both entities are tax exempt. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's no, no property tax. Yeah. Okay, that's what I thought. Yeah. Okay, kept coming up. It was yeah. way up. Is it free? Is it... And, uh, yeah, usually in a commercial the time, lease, they'll include somewhere in the taxes area. as a yeah. you know cam or whatnot. So cam. Okay. It was the 6P to 6A uh, parking right. spots for the district. Mm -hmm. We talked about that with Bill, didn't we? Was that because if they wanted to keep vehicles there overnight, uh, okay. if they have any district vehicles, they'd like to keep okay. in the parking lot overnight. Okay. Because otherwise... Shift between snow removal, like, locations and... Uh, okay. Different. All right. I was... It was going to be Kind of backwards, but that makes sense. Yeah, there's plenty of parking for yeah um, their vehicles and and our staff and its visitors. Yeah. All right. Anybody have any other comments or questions? Seeing none, always. Uh, let's see. Do we? Yeah. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Everybody's on on board. The motion carries. And Tony's joined. And Tony's here. Hi, Tony. Hi, guys. I'm so sorry I'm late. Uh, part of it is me trying to figure out how to use Zoom on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. uh, I'm gl I'm glad I'm I'm glad I'm I'm here, and uh, I apologize for my tardiness. No problem. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then. Five D Grand Crossing Park and Lake Ridge Bank River Front River Rink twenty twenty three reports. Before Missy starts, I just want to say um, I think this is a really well done report. Missy and Jessica put a lot of time into it. We do a lot of tracking. I hold them fiscally responsible to the success of this and they take that task seriously. Um, you know, this is year five of ice skating operations and uh, we are a unique municipality. We are the second government run outdoor refrigerated ice rink in the state. Um, there's been several others now that have popped up and there's always a lot of discussion about the value and financial feasibility of it. And over the last several budget cycles since COVID, I think we've demonstrated that we can operate this shrink and meet our revenue goals and our expenditures and create, quite frankly, a destination spot in Monona. So um, I'm extremely proud of the process that we went through as this committee for the design of this park and the construction and the buy-in um, to create this kind of winter wonderland. And we learn something every every year and it's been awesome. It looks looks great. It looks great with all the lights. And uh just we stepped into Green Bay at Title Town and looking at that whole development there with the ice skating rink and yeah. the, the snow tubing area and everything else. I don't I don't know if that's municipal run or not. It's not. No, it's not. But it's a PP, like a PPO, like okay. park, park city property with, you know. But it's great oh, because the Howard one or no. Title Town. No, Title Town's not city. It, okay. It's 
Yeah, it's just our it's, Grand Crossing looks like a mini version of that, which is which is pretty awesome. And I wish we could keep yeah. those lights out all year. Oh, yeah, it is it's stunning. It is. It's a winter wonderland over there. And we had a lot invested in part of wanting to do it up well for James out. And I would say we even exceeded what we yeah, thought looks, we would do. Looks it fantastic. Go beyond. Yes. And Public Works let us reuse and recycle right. a shed that they were getting rid of, which made that beautiful archway. So awesome. we, we kept something from going in the landfill and made it a little better for the community. So it really was a win-win for all, which is fantastic. Awesome. Great. And, and your report the, is fabulous, too. Uh, the photos. Oh, my gosh. Um, Good job. <laughs> we, uh, we wouldn't have had ice skating this year, really, if it wasn't for that rain. Like, not on the pond. Oh, absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. We, uh, we have even out on Edgewater, which is the only other refrigerated ice skating rink in the you know, immediate area, and they've been closed multiple days that we've still been open and able to skate. So awesome. we really, like Jake said, the test to the group, we picked out a good chiller and a, a appropriate amount of, you know, glycol pumping through for to really keep going, which is awesome. We really have had a fantastic season, and so it's interesting um, in how we support or think, because here, Jessica and I are in the beginning of our 23-24 season, but the report really reflects everything from J1 to December 31st. So we kind of have this cross cross budget system on how we operate and work, which in the end, yes, overall it flushes out from year to year where some things go out, but it, it poses kind of an interesting challenge on when and how we purchase and where it goes. So everything you see right now would be transactions day one, January through the 31st, year to date numbers. I think you all know who we are pretty much by now, but we are the best regional recreation, you know, attraction and outdoor rink here in Dane County, which we're really excited, especially as Patrick just mentioned that we are probably one of the only places in town right now. So we are located in Grand Carlton Park, and we also operate our Willow Deck Concession Stand, which has a lot of yummy sweet treats and beverages to enjoy and cool ice cream to nibble on. This is some fun, nice, interesting demographics that I think is really important to see on how we as a department operate and who we are and who we hire. We are a seasonal rink facility, and we do have a bulk of individuals that kind of fall into a demographic range. So you can see we have 34 total employees, the range over our state concession attendants, which serve you your concession items or get you your uh, skate rentals or into the rink. We have six that um, cross from being an instructor and an admission uh, attendant. We have four skate instructor only that specialize in hockey and ice skating, and then two ice maintenance team members, which all play a really vital part in helping us make our revenue and keeping the uh, facility safe and a great place to be. So each position has its own very unique value to what we do. Our age breakdown, we have four employees that are uh, above the age of 25. Two of those are ice maintenance employees and then some in and out ice speed instructors um, and our ice rink manager. Five employees who are between the age of 24 and 19. Those are basically our seasonal college kids. They come in for only a very short amount of time. Our bulk time though, that the rink is open. They're home, you know, December 3rd, uh, 21st to January 21st. They give us a lot of hours, but then they're gone. The bulk of our people are between the age of 14 and 18, as you can see, 25 employees. So when we, as a staff, talk about who we hire and what we do, it involves a lot of training and a lot of um, patience, I should say, to work with them. Um, but the more that we can train and the more that we can do, we hope that these employees work with us one, two, three, four years out. At the pool, we're really great. We have over like a 60% retention rate, which is fantastic to do when you're talking to a staff of 50. Here has opened up another opportunity that now we give year round opportunity for people to work. So those that are working at the pool now can work in the fall teaching um, different rec programs and then they come into the rink and go back to teaching rec programs and then they come back to the pool. There's a lot of employees that really work that year-round seasonal position. 25 of them live right here in Monona. 
That's fantastic. So when we talk about live, work, and play local, like we hit all of that right on the, the head. 25 in Luna, one cottage grow, two Madison, and then the rest live within ancillary Dane County, Farland, so forth. So we really hire a great amount of kids that work and live right here. So fantastic to be a part of. These are the future people of our country, and we give them the basis of their, you know, job performance. We hold them to high standards, and we hope that we can give them the tools to succeed on to the future. We operate 105 days. That's from January through now. So our season really runs a little shorter when you keep it together, but that's total, total year days. So in comparisons, we almost were 2,000 total visits more from last year to this year. And we had nearly, what, 500 more skate rentals. That's a lot of yeah. use. 10% more than great. great numbers to see. I attribute that a lot to being fortunate enough to get the Dane County Tourism or the Monona Tourism Grant which allowed us to really hit that Dane County market in the state of Wisconsin on a large scale. We are on- Can you just expand a little bit about that, about what that entailed? Yeah. I think we talked about it before, but- So we um, went for the tourism board and um, put a submission in an application for a large scale marketing scheme that included publications within Chevel, Wisconsin. So we have a lot of online uh, presence on their social media sponsored um, ads and then large scale um, Midwest family broadcasting. So we're on all of the local radio stations, including WVMO, which is our own. Um, and we have had, I would say more play than what we even paid for. They've been very generous on the airtime. And if you listen to any of the local radio stations, you probably heard Jessica and I on there by now, because it's all over the place. So I really think that that helped reach a larger market. We're seeing Edgerton. People came last week on a Wednesday for from Janesville. Like, people are traveling to come visit our destination which then brings up the point of residents versus non-residents and user-friendly happiness, which we provide a lot of other opportunities on the rink for our users. That's far past just the open skate opportunity. I mean, we're doing the learn to skate. With, we have nearly 300 people in our learn to skate lessons, something that right now outside, I can't say that enough, but not be happening. And that is a very unique niche to us that no other park and rec department is really doing. Um, 73 season passes sold. That includes family um, and individual. That does not capture the additional um, 60 passes that include employees as a benefit to you know anyone that's full-time or permanent part-time employee so that's an additional um you know group of people that are out on the ice and then something new that we just started tracking and one of our um, latest things was our free sponsor skate nights we wanted to really get each some data we saw numbers coming through the door that we've never seen before so on our free sponsored skate nights we had roughly 450 people probably because we didn't capture everybody in just a one and a half events. So it's a lot of people. We have had more first time skaters on the ice this season than we have ever seen before on these free sponsors. Mm -hmm. Free sponsored nights. It's a lot of skate and S's in a row. So <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll just jump in there quickness. We talk. Yeah. Uh, a salvo muse night, Tuesday nights to get in Okay. It, you don't you worry. <laughs> so, our nights. Jumping in on my, my thing. So, in addition, so when I talk to things that residents can really use, you know, we have our special events, the ring party packages for people that have December birthdays, myself included, the limited options are very limited. So, we, we provided a birthday destination space for people to use it on weekends to bring their kid this outdoor and fun. We do private rentals. We tapped into the homeschool market. So now Thursdays during the daytime from 11 to 2.30 is bopping with homeschool people, which is fantastic to see. And then we have school field trips on Wednesdays and Fridays at the rink almost every week booked. 
All right, so what does it really take to make it? And what did we actually make? So I would say that's the more, most important. It's great we have all these things, but our biggest sale and our biggest drive here is our admission and our skate rentals. We're bringing in close to 60,000 alone in admission and skate rentals. And then we got our other big ticket item is our concession sales. Concession sales really do go almost January 1 through December 31st with a couple close months for our off season at below deck, but that does include all the spring, summer, and fall revenue in okay. there. And then we have our, our ancillary, our, our lessons and our birthday parties, memberships, and some of our, our off season programming, which includes like bags, leash, and some other things to activate the site down in the, the summertime. In comparison, this year we brought in 139. 829. I was $70 short of 100. I'm so close. 100, I was so close. 170. I was so close. And then in comparison, we made almost 10,000, 11 more than 2022. And then the expenses, staffing is always going to be our biggest thing. People, it takes people to run, it takes people to work, it takes what we do. So staffing is always our biggest, biggest expense. And then Stuff that it takes to make run, our equipment and repairs when things break, our utilities, gas and electric, our concessions and supplies, and then our stuff it takes to run our spotlight, our fun special events. Total 136,460. So we do come up, surprisingly, just a little bit at the rink, which is fantastic to see. And I can only assume that this number can continue to go up. And we, you know, really reach a, a time of where we're finally at a plateau here. So we're, we're always exploring new ways of bringing in revenue sources and how to maximize. Do we go back to, you know, designated skate times to control amount of people and enjoyment and then stack more up? Do we keep it open? So we'll kind of see how we, we play out in the future, but it's really exciting. And it was a lofty goal. Our budget number in 2022 was 90000 and we're up to 140. So, I mean, awesome. we, we blew it out of the water last year. We didn't think that we were going to, like, blow it out again, and what we did. So, great to see. All you can see at the rink are smiling faces, smiling faces, people, packed stuff. Whatever, whenever you're in there, it's just fun. We not only have public open skate, but we do a lot of community involvement. We partner with Mesma, Mesma for Business After Four. This is a cute little video, and I had a feeling it wasn't going to play on Jake's computer or up here. So I'm going to just open it up on mine real quick. Maybe you can hear it, if anything. Mm -hmm. I just think it's really nice. Like the ice is really nice, and all the staff are really nice as well. They like coming here with my school a lot, so it's a perfect time to make that too. Love it. Um, my favorite thing about the rink is how well, I'm welcoming everybody. How welcoming everybody is. So MG21 comes every week. They use it as their, their gym time and their, their fun, safe space to be, which is fantastic to see. Um, we hosted a private closed event with GGs and the Down Syndrome Association of Wisconsin. Talk about first time experience and first time impact on the ice. This was probably our biggest one time impact on putting people on ice that would never get the opportunity to perform. We partner with Winona Public Library, and we do scoops and stories once a month. So they provide the librarian and the stories, and we provide the space and ice cream. And then we work with organizations like Underground Pet Rescue, where they do their cute little Christmas push for puppies. And look at, they have Santa in front of our Christmas tree with dogs. <laughs> How unique is that? Yes. It's a dog at ice skate, though. <laughs> we have not. That, that is one thing. If it's enough to underground pet rescue, we have a thousand and ten dog owners at Grand Crossing Parks. So that, <laughs> that opens up something we do not want to venture. Only three are registered. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. 
Now, Evenings on the Ice is what Jake is referencing. We took a uh, Tuesday night, a night that we have minimal people at the ice, and we have now turned it into our busiest top-end night at the rink. Evenings on the Ice are sponsored by a business. They pay a fee to have their names said multiple times, promos, and our emails. People get free ice skates and free admissions, and then they're responsible for paying concessions. We went from $100, $200 on a Tuesday night to now bringing in minimum $500 in concessions, okay. plus what the business is paying on top of the sponsorship. Mm -hmm. So this took and activated a night that we had nobody there, and now they're there. So it's really great to see, like, Bubbler's been a sponsor, Skipper Buds, TDS has next week, and Lake Ridge Bank um, takes the other two. We are still soliciting for three more this season, so if you know anybody, Patrick's in. We are, we are all. It gives our residents and people who maybe couldn't afford the experience the opportunity almost weekly to enjoy the rink. Um, so we do have low-cost options, even though... Uh, the admission price and the rentals is relatively inexpensive for recreational opportunities of this, you know, limited supply of ice skating. But it's been awesome to be able to offer this for free for people on a night. We got a call at the office, a nice little touching heart story about a woman who came to the first skate night that was free. Her son has no friends, does not actively involve himself in a lot of things. They decided to come to the rink. He fell in love with skating, invited, she called us to the office crying because she was so excited, so thankful. Low income would have never come to the rink any other way. They then since have been to the rink every Tuesday to go ice skating and her child had his birthday party there with the two friends that he had. Oh, and she's like, that's awesome. it has changed my life. Hmm. I have heard these stories multiple times throughout the years of working here now. I have two new employees who are sitting at the desk listening to this crying <laughs> because they could not believe what we do and how big of an impact that is. So we really do change lives with what we do. What are some of the improvements we did in 2023? Surprisingly, we added 40 new pairs of skates, and we still don't have enough. This has been almost every Tuesday night and Saturday and Sunday on the weekends. Problems we run into, though, is storage, just like everywhere else. So even though we want more, we probably don't have the space or place to put them. So we have to figure that out in the future. But we are running out of some of our high demand sizes, which seem to be six, seven, eight, nines of those crossover sizes. But it's great. We added 40 pairs. We got rid of some other skates that are in need of disregard and have now made a really great uniform um, skate experience down there. We added- How many skates do we have in total? <sighs> fluctuates because we continually buy when yeah. some break. Right. We're probably close to, I think, 120 pairs of skates. Okay. That uh, ranges anywhere from toddler size 6, 7, all the way up to adult 15. And you will sell out, um, we sell out. some of those. Mm -hmm. Multiple times. Mm -hmm. um, we have five new skate assists. We had six in stock. We purchased five more. These are really great for those first time skaters. And then we also found out that they're really great for messing around on too. So we added some <laughs> signage and usage rules, which has actually nipped the problem 100% in the butt. Well, 95% in the butt, I would say, which is great to see. Um, just adding a little rules and signage really did make a big difference on this one. Um, and then I think our biggest addition and improvement here would be additional seating. When we start to push more and more people through the door, that just means you need more and more places for them to sit. And then if you're trying to keep people outside, you need to keep them warm outside. So we added some additional heat sources and some fire pits and really expanded um, towards Riverside. 
And then just some other fun things we do throughout the year. We hold scoops and stories in the summertime at the park. We do our dance recital for our rec program at the park. We held, of course, a Barbie night at the park for who did not jump on the Barbie bandwagon this year. We partnered with Zars Promise um, with some barks and bingo. So we do offer some dog friendly events because the residents really seem to like that. So that's what they wanted. And then of course we just have our overall enjoyment of the park. Lots of families are just going there for the ancillary ice cream and park experience. And then another unique to us experience is outdoor fitness um, opportunities at the deck. This past year, we had a sponsor who covered all instructor costs. So we were able to offer free fitness in the park all summer long. And we had upwards of classes that sometimes got like 40 to 50 people in them, depending on the night and the temperature, which is fantastic to see. So having a sponsor to cover that cost is wonderful. So overall, it took a lot of effort, a lot of strength, a lot of sweat, tears. <laughs> staff, but we had a really fun, successful year. We're excited to see what happens in 2024. I, I can't wait to see the limit. Well, that was a really good report this year, and you guys have done, you've done an amazing job with this so many, in so many different aspects. Um, yeah, <laughs> I was, you know, a little skeptical back five years ago when we were talking about this. Mm -hmm. Probably everybody had a little, like, little skepticism about it, and wow. So. This is a great question. Like, this is a great question. Like, the data compared to when we used to do this on, in the park, right? But, uh, how much has this grown with uh, what was happening there? <laughs> Sorry. Well, we've never truly done winter rentals in the park at the scale that we've done now. Oh, we did okay. minimal ice skate rentals with the hockey um, skates that we had in years prior. So I was $1,500. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe two thousand with some snowshoe rentals, um, you know, coupled in there. It's a completely different beast than what we even sure. were able. The space, the place, the capability of what we had at the Dream Park does nothing to this. And we all can see, twelve years ago, starting, we had a beginning of December till you know part of March, and here we are mid January, not even with. No any ice, ice. No ice. Any ice. So none of this would be possible without that, you know, glimmer of an idea five years ago that has, in my opinion, snowballed into a great thing. So should we be considering putting a dome over it so we can run it all year? <laughs> <laughs> Stay tuned yes. for our future. Future. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting. We follow a lot of. I, don't I know you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. We follow a lot of park and rec departments <laughs> around the state that do the land rinks with the liners and they fill it. It's a bathtub, oh, basically. Right, sure. And this is the weekend that about clockwork, 70% of them will be like, well, looks like we're going to have to wait a little longer because someone decided to, you know, step on the ice before it was ready. And so, like, if anybody follows Madison Parks, they had a big issue up, a, yeah, not pretty situation. So it's, it's like, this is really good test case for actually communities in Wisconsin to say, if you want to expand a skate season, provide consistent ice and opportunities for lessons and bringing in groups, et cetera, um, you can do it. It takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of effort, but um, I think it's worth it and to have. Now, we do know there's one coming online in Verona. It's part of a, a mixed use development. So it'll be interesting to see how that one tends to operate. I'm always gonna bet on our team and what we can do and what we can offer. And uh, as we move forward, um, we do have, you know, some decisions to make about kind of next steps with Grand Crossing and how we consistently increase our revenue opportunities 
um, and use of that space in both the winter and the summer season. Um, so I would anticipate having something, you know, to present. Uh, we're kind of putting together some budget numbers and funding options um, for some other options. So I just wanted to bring that, you know, probably yearly thing just to see this how we're doing. The 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 revenue, the the budget of goal is 130,000. We brought in close to 140. The expenditure was actually 140,000 this year. Um, so we are budgeted to lose 10,000 with um, between, expenses and, and part-time staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and we use that for like replacing the sod if we have to do the sod. Mm -hmm. So this year we did have yeah. to do the sod. The year before, based on uh, Alder Dapula's recommendations, suggestion was we got all these recycled um, picnic tables. So the poly wood got more seating. Mm -hmm. um, so that'll be an option for you know, potential rental reservation space of that with having up to 60 seats available. Um, it's great furniture and has really uh, helped out, I think, in just providing more opportunities to eat and sit. Um, but it's expensive. And so we kind of like having a $10,000 um, buffer in there, uh, but we're, we're still looking at ways to recapture additional revenue um, for the city. Okay. Yeah. All right. Again, I want to reflect on what Doug said. Uh, Jake, Missy, I mean, your crew has done a incredible job in being able to create a, a space that, you know, you don't know what's going to be happening next. I mean, it just, uh, I was so impressed to be at Buck and Honey's and to be able to look down on the, the lights and to, to see the, the people skating and having a, an amazing time. And so, Thank you for all of the work that uh, all of you have put into making it a, a special place for Monona. The one thing I'll I'll offer, and we've we've talked in the past also, um, you the staff are always doing above and beyond. And you know my recommendation is post that you need some people to help with the shoveling. Uh, as we were talking before the meeting, I mean, you said that it took a lot of work just to get things ready so that you could be saving yesterday and today. Post it, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people who would be coming down with their plastic shovels to be able to to help and get things clear. The takedown, um, you know, that is a lot of work to get all of the boards taken down and all of that. And, you know, all of you in spring have a lot to do. And so I think however others would be able to help out, and I think there's, and you were saying too, I mean, just more and more people skating, more and more people are going to be interested in coming down and helping at the ring. So uh, reach out to the community. There's a lot that are, you know, a lot of people who are willing to help. Much appreciated. Hey. Okay. Anything else on, the, on that? You know, the yeah. Yeah, I, I would second um, what Jeff said that, you know, here you've heard me use the term hitting a home run as he's like sports analogies. This would be like hitting a grand slam. You know, so it's a little different. You know what a grand slam is? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Jeez. But she's so. the Cubs fan, so they don't say that. I so, actually do not like baseball. That is my out of all sports. Yeah. <laughs> a co but a compliment for you, in addition to that, just really well presented to yep. how you did it was perfectly done. One one question I had about one of the things you mentioned is you had during the summer you have people that someone that don donated money to provide free sort of um, fitness classes. Mm -hmm. Is that going to continue in any way, or is that kind of up in the air? I'm hoping so. Okay. I'm with the company that did it last year, did not um, has not recommitted to this year, but okay. I also have not. Asked again. Do they get publicity for that to do that? Oh, great. Yeah, they okay. had on site so, publicity websites. That struck me as a good marketing thing for summer where, you know, we're going to have to really shift our focus on that and getting people we used to seeing exercise classes there. I mean, that been, in itself is worthwhile, I think. We've been running it since 2020, exercise yeah. classes there. So we have had it, but the, the free aspect has obviously it's great. enticed more people yeah. to come out and do it. So. Yeah. All right. Well done. Thanks. 
can we can just add just on on the bigger picture that the recognition of of the Grand Crossing, but you guys do this in so many ways. You've got your fingers on the pulse of this community, but you, you guys listen. You bring those together. You create things, whether it's spectacular and what the Easter egg hunt, the fall festival, all these things that just make this community a strong, special place. And it keeps coming up and you do it under tremendous stress and extra hours. And as Jeff says, we're here to help you too and pitch in because we're proud to be a part of that. And thank you. Just, just thanks you guys. Okay, and then we'll move on to the director's report. Do you want to start? Do you have anything or no? You can go first. Okay, uh, so in your packet, I just included our tree order for this year. Um, not definite planting locations, got some ideas, but uh, we'll probably bring back next month. Um, this nursery we've had pretty good luck with. So they start taking orders in, they start taking orders in October and we just jump on right off the bat and kind of do what we feel as a staff is kind of a good mix of um, trees. There are uh, several replacements that we have this year with a micro force, all of our bur oaks from the last year at Schluter and Winnequa. Uh, so we're going to do something a little different with how we prep and plant those. Um, and we anticipate with the Winnequa Park Path that we'll have opportunities for fall planting and our donor program. And that would be a, an additional order. But this is another 30 some trees. And so that'll put us well over 200 trees in Winnequa Park in the last three to four years. Uh, so from the uh, oak removals. Um, those will be coming right around Arbor Day. So we generally get a delivery there. We have the school that we plant three or four, our staff. So, um, so if there's other locations outside of Winnequa that you feel could use some trees and Arrowhead, um, <laughs> uh, bring that info to the next uh, meeting. Tony, I think, wants to say something my hair. Tony? It, it, is it that obvious? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, at, uh, Jake and Missy, um, the tree list is, is wonderful. It's a ton of native trees, um, which is a wonderful example to lead um, our community by planting trees that are very much a necessity for pollinator habitat. And um, there's just a few that are not, which is, that's okay. You know, I, I think they're all welcome, but it, I love the, the pivot towards, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's, if it's necessarily a pivot, but the focus on trees that provide some, what is a fancy term that we should all be familiar with is ecological services, right? We want plants that aren't just pretty, but we want plants that actually function some value to our fauna uh, in light of climate change right now. So um, I'm very happy with the tree list. Um, I'm familiar with a lot of these trees. Uh, I think uh, the the caliper is wonderful. You know, a two inch caliper less uh, on a bald and burlap tree ensures um, uh, that those trees are going to get established and not be too stressed out. Sometimes when you go bigger, you have events like we had last summer in May where we didn't have any rain forever. And now you're around watering all these trees. So uh, I'm very happy with 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 the tree selection. Um, and, you know, I guess one of my questions that I'll have, Jake, is we put a lot of trees in Winnequa, and we will have a master plan. You know, we've been talking about it as long as I've been on the board to redo the park. And, you know, trees are the bones and the anchors and the, really the skeletons of parks and landscapes. And if there's been any thought in terms of, like, where these trees are going, how they might affect the master plan, be it routes, fields, park, play areas. Um, because I feel when we just kind of plop a tree here and there, it might impact 
or guide a sort of design aesthetic once we get to the point of designing a master plan for the park. I personally feel that the master plan for the park should be designed around an aesthetic that is focused around that water area. I've said it before. And so, um, you know, if we're going to put 30 some odd number of trees uh, in that park is our consideration to the future as to how they're going to impact a master plan design to the flow of that space and or are they going to be considered for use in other parks uh, in the city? Thank you. Stoney. Um, the other thing I wanted to report on was the apartment complexes that are under construction right now, the Bloom on Monona Drive, the um, Monona Gardens project, and then the Broadway apart, uh, complex. Those all pay fees to the city for parkland dedication. Uh, those three properties uh, will pay close to three hundred thousand um, dollars. That is unrestricted funds for park um, development, existing park development. So there will be some recommendation, I think, coming from our department to this committee on a strategy on whether we want to just um, use those funds the next capital budget cycle and not borrow under the general obligations, whether we want to try to balance it out um, and where the priorities are. So we've got a couple options that as we get into the capital budget season, we'll be presenting on potential use. So most communities around Dane County, this is how they fund their art capital budget. So DeForest, Wanakee, Fitchburg, Cottage Grove has almost a million dollars in their dedication balance. Um, so when you see things happening in Dane County in the park system, especially in those other communities, they're using parkland dedication most often. Uh, we just mm -hmm. haven't had that type of new growth or we've negotiated with development agreements that didn't have it. So like the last one we had, I think was um, the Trista and then the Fairway Glen. And we used Trista right away for a lot of boat launch. Um, so this is good. So when we do have redevelopment in Manoa, uh, we do see some impacts financially that we can put back into the system. The last thing that I just wanted to point out, what did I have it on? Oh, this is an update. So this, all the flags in Winnipeg Park are survey work. And so there's probably need to update the website that just because there's flags in certain locations that that doesn't mean that's where things are gonna, gonna go. That's merely all the uh, data points that the designers need to put together the plan. So hopefully they got everything they needed before the snow um, that gets sent over to uh, Blake from Park Esher, and he'll use our rough concept to start to put together a draft of the pet plans. Ideally we'll have that for next month, but it's anticipated that we would be bidding it out in February, March, and looking at construction um, mid-August through October. Uh, we did reschedule our candlelight snowshoe hike. That's supposed to be Saturday night uh, with Madison Aldo, kind of looking at the forecast while we got snow, which was awesome. It's gonna be like negative 16 wind chill at five o'clock on Saturday night. So the, the of course, um, I didn't want to be out there. <laughs> we didn't want to be out there. So that's going to be February 17th. Which is a great weekend because it actually falls on the Discover Monona weekend, which is in part with um, MESBA. So I actually just got the email as it came through that they're able to last minute get us in as part of great. the um, schedule plan flyer. So it's a great rescheduled date for us. I don't have to 
Well, he stole my first point that we are rescheduling uh, this candlelight snowshoe hike. But just looking up on a few things coming on the horizon, we are in that window right now that park shelter reservations are available for Monona residents and Monona residents only right now. So if you have anybody that's looking to reserve a party or park shelter, right now is your chance because February 2nd goes live to non-residents. If we want to make sure we're taking care of those Monona residents first and getting their window in. As Jake mentioned, February 15th is going to be our after school and summer camp registration window um, opening. So we'll have that on the docket. And then the first Monday is always, first Monday in April is always swim lesson registration, which is our next big question item for people. Um, so first Monday in April will be our swim lesson registration for Monona residents. They have a two week window before non residents can start registering. So just kind of keeping some of those big picture dates up there for residents to know and be aware of. That's the worst thing when they say they're not in the know. So we want to make them in the know. Okay. Any questions for staff? Um, uh, then uh, item seven, any updates or discussion on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts? I, I would just point out that the free skate is a perfect example um, of that kind of thing, both social economic uh, opportunity. Correct. And then we also hosted the GGs and Down Syndrome of Wisconsin South Central event. Um, and then I think that's pretty much it right now on our big DEI initiatives and efforts. <laughs> okay. Uh, and then item eight, updates and discussion on San Damiano Steering Committee and Friends of San Damiano. There's a third and then final public information uh, meeting uh, scheduled for January 17th, so a week from tonight at 6.30 at the Minnesota River High School. Um, I think there will be, we're going to do, there will be a presentation it won't, it'll be structured a little bit differently. It's probably got to be more presentation heavy would be my expectation. And not, you know, we're not going to do post-it notes like that would be on that stage. So there's the, the revised final draft plan is on the website. Um, and it's about 150 pages in length. And I think it was, you know, they did a nice job of laying out the, the different phases and it does not make a recommendation between keeping the house or not keeping it and building a replacement facility. Um, partly because we really, the community, the feedback we got is basically 50-50 on that issue. Um, and we don't really, at this point, know what the donor appetite is for one or the other options, which obviously could change which choice we make. Um, so, that did you want to do for the friends? Sure. Yeah. Um, so, with friends, um, the board, we've got some changes on the board this year. Andy Kitzler, who has been the president from the beginning and has done a tremendous job and so much work, is stepping down and he, he will stay on the, the board and he'll be um, chairing the fundraising committee. But um, Wes Mosman Block is, is uh, the new president too. And, and um, Wes is well connected, but he's been on the steering committee and very much involved. So uh, really, uh, we're lucky to have him step in and take on that, that role. We're um, in the middle of, I think most, a lot of our events are on the calendar for this year. One glitch that just came up, um, the Snow Snake event was scheduled for January 26th, and um, Bill Quackenbush is no longer able to, to come and do that. So we're, we're looking for an alternative date. We've got a few that he can come, but it's not matching up with auxiliary parking and, and all of that kind of stuff. So um, uh, hopefully by the end of the day tomorrow, that a decision will be made. Will there be an alternative or will we just have to cancel? And right, I don't know what to say right, 
right now. I know we did, I, I submitted an application for a tourism grant to help fund this and they meet tomorrow. <laughs> so we'll see, we may have to, to change it, but there's a lot of fun events coming up and there'll be many opportunities to volunteer and come and experience it from doing volunteer work to, to you know, observing birds to beer gardens to uh, another gala in, in the fall. So lots happening there. Okay. And anything else from anybody? Yep. Well, Missy, you started it. You had mentioned pickleball earlier. <laughs> uh, I'd like to, Jake, you know, thank you, Missy, uh, Jessica, for allowing pickleball to continue at the courts this winter. Uh, we were able to keep playing. Uh, I think there was one snowstorm. The sun certainly melted the, the snow on the, the courts, and we were able to play a couple days after that. Um, and then we had the snowstorm on, I think it was Saturday. And then uh, there was another group that came in and actually shoveled. Uh -huh. They were a bunch of rookies, I would have to say, the way they shoveled the courts. I mean, it was just kind of improper shoveling that they did. Um, but there is certainly the, the interest out there, and I, I fully support closing the courts now. Um, you know, yeah. And Jessica and Missy, we met and we, we talked about some of the damage that has occurred with uh, the courts with clearing the, the snow and sometimes sh uh, cutting some of the, or chopping some of the, the ice that formed. So keeping them closed for the winter, I, I'm certainly fully supportive. Suggestion I have though is uh, having some type of a gate on the door just so that it can be locked and then the signage on the, the courts and hopefully we'll have a early spring and the snow will melt what we have had uh, and what is coming this coming weekend that we could uh, start playing early but uh, appreciate the opportunity to to play as long as we have been able to play this year and uh, we uh, look forward to Getting back on the courts. Or do my courts close signed right now as you say that? <laughs> uh, and just for the committees, every other Dane County community that has dedicated pickleball courts shuts them down, pulls their nets, generally early October. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we were able to be a little flexible and acknowledge the warm weather and keep those temporary nets up and allow play. We did have a, a door on that. And I think I have it. I got to double check at the pool. I'm 90% sure that top. we still have it. Okay, it's up top. So we will get that taken care of and, and signed. But it was a just, it is nice to see um, people using our parks and using our facilities, especially in uh, uh, inclement weather or colder weather times um, without having damage done. Uh, and, and now we're at that point where we're probably snow and cold for a good chunk of January. Um, but, and we got a nice thank you card and from some of the players. So I, I think they acknowledge that as well. The appreciation was there. Good. Yes, it was noted. Good. 12, 12 minutes. I don't know if landmarks is meeting today or not. Well, <laughs> we're not going to be here for 12 more minutes. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Does anybody else have anything else? Good. May I say something? Uh, I'm just a, business, a resident and play pickleball. Sure. Right. Maybe we will be here till <laughs> oh, <I'm not, laughs> not because of me. Uh, I've been a resident of Menorah since uh, since '72. So Could you give us your name? David Cerrone, live on Wild Haven Avenue, and I just started playing pickleball this year, and I've been enjoying it, and I appreciated. Uh, uh, the court staying open. I better go. One of my concerns is, as I've started playing, I picked up from the people there, many of whom, if they're not Monona residents, they were former Monona residents. Uh, that they sense an animosity between the park, the city, and the, their play, and some of them don't understand that. And I'm concerned about that because I'm enjoyed living here in the park, playing. It's been nice that we had the courts open, but I don't know if, I, if you're going to address that or not. I don't know if I commit. There is a, an email list or two 
that everybody who plays gets, you know, some note saying, this is our goal, this is our plan, this is why we do something. Uh, some little more communication. Okay. Uh, even if there's a way of opening it early, or if there's some approved way of cleaning snow off so that people can play, even if they bring their own nets. Uh, but I just wanted to mention that I've sensed this animosity, and I, I didn't like that. I like living here. I wish they appreciated it greatly. I'm the one initiated that. Thank you, Milton. Thank okay. you. <laughs> No, thank you. Thank you. Um, there's a lot, there's a long backstory to that. So maybe talk about it after or some other time, but sure. Yeah. Uh, but thank you. Uh, anything else? Then uh, just one question going back a bit to the uh, friends, the, the median on the seventh. Is the seventeenth? Seventh. 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 At MG, will that 150 page report is that available to people not attending online or how's okay? Yeah, great. Okay. That'd be my only concern, but yep. yeah. all right. Then I believe a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Yes, second. All in favor of adjourning say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. Up in the Zoom land. <laughs> <laughs>